Good evening and welcome. My name is Matt Abbott. I'm the Director of Government and Diplomatic Programs here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Welcome to our program, 444 Days, Voices of the Iran Hostage Crisis. Today's event is on the record and we are live streaming. Please silence your phones, though we do welcome social media engagement. The Council is an independent and nonpartisan platform. Views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent views or positions of the Council. Before this evening's program begins, we will hear a flash talk from Dr. Amir Farmanesh. Dr. Farmanesh is the CEO and President of People Analytics, Iran Poll, and Vox Dash. His work focuses on demystifying people's behaviors and opinions in complex societies and difficult contexts such as Iran. He holds degrees from Syracuse's, Syracuse University's Maxwell School and a PhD in Policy Studies from the University of Maryland College Park. Following the flash talk, we'll begin our panel discussion and I'll introduce our panelists at that time. Unfortunately, Professor John Stemple, the former deputy chief of the political section at the US Embassy in Tehran is unable to join us tonight. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Farmanesh. Hello, hello. I appreciate the chance to be here and hello to Chicago. It's my first time here. Thanks for the welcome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> My name is Amir Farmanesh. I'm presenting to you a survey that has been jointly done between Iran Poll and Chicago Council on Global Affairs. The title being Iranian Public Opinion Four Decades After the Hostage Crisis. So, yeah. so Iran Poll. Uh, we are an independent company focusing on uh, opinion polling only on Iran but from Toronto, Canada. Hello to Canadian consulate uh, people here. We are based in Toronto, and that's actually one of our call centers in Toronto. Opinion polling, scientific opinion polling from Iran has been proven to be reliable, scientific, and as an example, in their last presidential election in Iran in 2017, um, when President Rouhani, the current president, was selected, Iran poll was able to predict the results of the election we send the results, the predictions to The Economist. The Economist published it one day before the election, and it is there for you to see. Uh, our prediction was accurate within two percentage points of the official results. So it is something that could be reliably used, as is with any other uh, polling. So the polling I'm presenting today is uh, used by exact same methodology, nationally representative, 1,000 sample size, it was conducted by telephone, and it was conducted in October 2019. It's very fresh. Going into it, Iranians say economy is bad, and it is getting worse. Interestingly, they blame their own government more than they blame the United States or the sanctions. So 68% of Iranians say economic situation is bad. 54% say it's getting worse. Now. 55% of Iranians, they blame the e domestic economic mismanagement and corruption. Only 38% blame the foreign sanctions and pressures. And as you can see, this has been a continuous trend. <clears throat> that does not, however, mean that the Iranians are not uh, seeing the effect of sanctions. When we ask how much of a negative influence are the sanctions having on the economic situation of your family, we get 76% of Iranians say it is having effect on them, negative effect. And 53% say it's having a lot of negative effect on their family. Despite these poor economic conditions, despite all the pressure, still Iranian people are not ready to give in to current administration's demands. So we propose a scenario to them. In this scenario, we told them, suppose that the United States were to propose a deal whereby most US sanctions on Iran would be gradually lifted and Iran would be able to have a peaceful nuclear energy program in return for agreeing to fully and permanently giving up the right to enrich uranium on its soil and to always allow international inspections of its facilities. Do you think uh, you would agree or not? And 73% of Iranians say, no, we reject that deal. 53% strongly rejected that deal. Now why? Two reasons. There is a classic rallying around the flag here. 
that's something that you can expect from any human society. When we ask in the same survey, how proud are you to be an Iranian? We get 90% of Iranians saying they're extreme, extremely proud or very proud to be, an, to be Iranian. Gallup is asking the, same, the very same questions continuously since a long ago. And right now, to give you a comparison, United States, the American people, they are 47% extremely proud to be American. Iranians are 68%. In fact, this level of saying they're extremely proud is very similar to 11 September in the uh, United States. So when there is a real attack towards your country, you have this effect, the rally around the flag. There is another point. Iranians really believe they have the right to have peaceful nuclear program, 90%. So that helps as well. A second reason for why Iranians are rejecting the deal that we put um, in front of them, it's the simple fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. It's the idea that if in JCPOA the world powers didn't help their part of bargain, who says they will keep it again? So we have been asking the popularity of JCPOA, JCPOA is the nuclear agreement with Iran, since 2015 continuously. 76% of Iranians used to support it, now that's down to 42%. We asked another question from Iranians. Thinking about how the JCPOA has worked out so far, which view is closer to yours? First, the JCPOA experience shows that it is worthwhile for Iran to make concessions because through compromise, Iran can negotiate mutually beneficial agreements with world powers. Or, the JCPOA experience shows that it is not worthwhile for Iran to make concessions because Iran cannot have confidence that if it makes a concession with world powers, they will honor the agreement. You get 72% of Iranians saying it's not worthwhile to make concession with the world powers. Okay, I want to end with good news. It's better. So first good news, Iranians are really not supportive of nuclear weapons program. When we ask them, do you think Iran should or should not develop nuclear weapons, we get 59% saying it should not. Interestingly, 66% of Iranians say development of nuclear weapons is against the teachings of Islam, while 17% they say Islam does not prohibit the development of nuclear weapons. Interestingly, only 18% of Iranians didn't have an opinion about what Islam says, which shows and a very confident people about Islam. Okay, the last point, Iranians are not categorically against negotiations with Trump administration. When we gave them this option, if the United States returns to the JCPOA, lifts all sanctions related to Iran's nuclear program, and is willing to talk in a forum that includes all the P5 plus one countries, would you support uh, under such a uh, situation negotiations with Trump administration. We see 75% of Iranians are supportive, even with talking with the current Trump administration. So the future does, hope, uh, does have some hope for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's now my distinct honor to welcome our panelists tonight. Kate Cobe is a former adjunct professor at Wartburg College. She spent over 27 years in the diplomatic service of the United States. And in 1979, she was serving as the director of the Iran America Society. She's one of the 52 Americans who spent 444 days as a hostage in Iran after the seizure of the US Embassy in Tehran. And Kathleen Stafford is an artist whose work has been acquired by American and foreign embassies and museums around the world. In 1979, she was serving as a visa clerk at the US Embassy in Tehran when the embassy was seized. She was one of six Americans who were exfiltrated from Iran with the assistance of the Central Intelligence Agency and the Canadian government after the embassy seizure. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. <laughs> Thank you again for being here. I'd like to start by setting the stage. In 1979, what was the political climate like in Iran when you arrived there? Well, there were curfews. Um, we were limited in terms of where we could go. My question was, what 
does an Islamic Republic look like? That was the reason I was there, because this was the stated uh, goal of the revolution, to establish an Islamic Republic. People were unsure. Everybody was treading lightly. Um, people who were known to have been workers for the Shah lived in fear. And people lived in fear because there were people just simply yanked out of their jobs and because of their loyalty to the Shah were tried and often executed. So it was a very tenuous situation when, we, for, when I first arrived in July. We were working very carefully to see what we could do and what we couldn't. I met with the, I was the director of the Iran America Society, but I met with the um, Italian Cultural Society, the German Cultural, director of the German Cultural, and et cetera. And we talked about what did we think we could and couldn't do in um, our cultural, cultural centers. So everyone was walking very carefully. That's what I remember the most. We were only there two months before the takeover. So we had arrived in September. We had just moved into our apartment. I had all the clothes hanging over the dining room chairs, waiting for the housekeeper. But she didn't come the day of the takeover. In fact, she was your housekeeper. That's right. <laughs> so, so I went on to work. <laughs> but uh, in, we were just all excited about this. this is a new adventure for us. We're going to see this wonderful country that's we were famous for its culture and poetry and history. And so we would. On weekends, we were able to do little little short trips, go up to the Caspian Sea, and we went up to Isfahan on uh, the weekend right. before the takeover. We made it back just in time. <laughs> <laughs> so Kate's uh, rem memories of, of what it was like before that are more clear than mine. Well, Monday marks the for uh, this Monday was the 40th anniversary of the seizure of the U.S. Embassy. Can you tell us what were your experiences on November 4th, 1979, and the subsequent days? Well, the Anjuman Irano America, the Iran America Society, was um, I think about three kilometers from the embassy. We had our own building. This was a very strong structure and had been going well for mi for many years. We worked together. Our our board, the board of this society, was both Iranian and American. We had English lessons, but we also had Farsi lessons. And so um, the Iranian board was working with us as we were trying to figure out with the Italians and the French and the Germans what we could do and where we could go. And on <clears throat> that morning, we were having a board meeting. And in the middle of the board meeting, my secretary, uh, Ava, came into the room and she said, Hanum uh, Kobe, I think you better take this phone call. It was one of my board members saying, there is a major demonstration going on at the embassy. You might want to check and see that everything's OK um, at um, the society. And as a matter of fact, two of my staff members got up and went down to the embassy to see if they could see what was going on. We turned on radio and, and television to see if anything was being carried on the local news. And it became very clear that this wasn't going to go away. So the story goes on from there. But it, 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 was, um, it was aggressive from the very beginning. We hoped, and my personal hope was, that the um, foreign ministry would do what they had done at an earlier demonstration. I think that was in February. They basically said, OK, you've made your point. You've demonstrated. This is an embassy. This is. Um, uh, these are diplomatic grounds. Now let's be on our way, and that we could settle down and see what was what was going on. That didn't happen, obviously. Um, back at the ranch, we were we were closed. Uh, the visa section was closed to protest the fact that there had been lots of graffiti down with down with America, death to Carter, written on the walls of the embassy that weekend. <clears throat> and so we were protesting, and we had no visa applicants that day. So I went over. I thought this was a good chance to go over and get my diplomatic ID card. So I walked across the compound and turned in my passport, <laughs> which meant I wasn't going anywhere without that afterwards. So uh, the ladies in that office were very nervous. And they said, why did you come to work today? And I said, I always come to work. And they said, no, but today is the day of the martyrs. And so then I went back across the compound and told my husband that he should go over there because those ladies were in a bad mood, and he should get his ID card, too. But if he had gone, he would have been in the chancery at the time of the takeover. So luckily, he didn't listen to me. And uh, we both ended up in the consulate. And uh, 
uh, slammed all the doors when we saw that there was a, a mob outside and people had sticks and bats and things like that. And so after about two hours, there were various activities that came and went and the, the RSO walked across the compound, our regional security officer walked across the compound and was trying to figure out what to do. He thought he could talk the students out of staying on the compound and leaving. And so after a while, uh, we thought we smelled smoke. Uh, we were all upstairs in the, on the second floor of the building because it was safer. We thought we smelled smoke, and so we thought we better, we were probably gonna have to leave, and we destroyed the visa plate so that no one could make false visas. And the other wife and I, there was one other spouse there, the other couple, uh, Cora Lijic and I, were there sort of on an exceptional basis. Uh, we were the only spouses there at, at post. We, the, um, um, the Washington had thought that they would be bringing back adult dependents. But after they saw how the state of the country and that it, it was unstable, they were rethinking that. But in any case, Cora and I just thought, well, now they're going to send us home because we can't issue visas anyway. So <clears throat> um, how, long, how far would you like me to go along? <laughs> I think that's a good point. OK. <laughs> Prior to November 4th, though, did you ever anticipate that something as dramatic as the actual seizure of the embassy was a possibility? Well, during our training period and, and talking about the history and what's going on, and given the history of the United States and embassies all um, around the world, my fear was that there might be some sort of a retaliatory um, act at some reason or somebody uh, but I thought we would probably all be told to pack one bag and get out of the country. That's the normal procedure. Although, um, that year, there had been a, a very serious demonstration of, um, and one of our ambassadors, I believe, was killed in Afghanistan mm -hmm. uh, earlier that year. And there were memories in my mind of other takeovers of um, not embassies, but American diplomatic facilities. And so I really was very much prepared to pack one suitcase and leave, but I was not prepared to stay for 14 months. That, that, no, I did not think that about that. Okay. Yes, I think we had a town hall meeting. Um, it must have been the week the weekend before that when uh, we were told that the Shah was going to be uh, the Shah was going to be allowed to enter the United States for medical treatment. So then the ambassador, I guess it was our charge, Ms. Bruce Langan, said there's there's various possibilities on the whole gamut of nothing will happen, and maybe they will try to attack the embassy. So. None of us knew what what would happen, so it was a, basically a wait and see. And, and as as Kate said, we were hoping that it was just going to be, at most, we'd have to leave. Kathleen, to pick up on where you stopped your story, I think many people in the room may be familiar with the Hollywood movie Argo, which dramatized your exfiltration from Iran. What did the movie get right, and where did they take some creative liberty? Well, <laughs> um, with that. There we were up on the second floor um, thinking we smelled smoke and we should leave. So f various people left in groups. We had people in the non-immigrant section that day, so all the Iranians left in one group. What happened was we looked, we looked outside the door, the back door, where the visa applicants could come in without having to enter onto the main compound. That was a little alley off the side, and so that was a separate entrance that only we had. So there was nobody there. The students either didn't know about that entrance or because the consulate had been moved from a different, play, different part of the compound, they weren't aware of it. And so we realized the coast was clear. So we left in small groups, first the Iranians, then our local, the, the visiting Iranians, and then our local staff. And then there were about 13, 12 or 13 of us Americans. So we split into smaller groups. And in our group, there were the Lijics, the other couple, um, Bob Anders, who was our, our boss, and Joe and I, my husband and I, and a couple of other people. So we all, we went out with our group. It started to rain, which was probably really lucky because we put up umbrellas, and it, that everybody was concerned about rain and not us. And so then we headed off toward the British Embassy, which was supposed to be our sanctuary, and we didn't know where it was. So luck, one of the Iranian employees said she would show us. And um, as we were going, uh, walking that way, we saw a really large mob, another group of people coming from that direction. So Bob Anders was with us, and he said, I live close by. I'm going home. 
And we said, we're coming with you, Bob. <laughs> so we s separated a little bit more and walked to Bob's house and listened to every, when we got to his house, we listened to the embassy radio and we could hear voices. We could hear all the Americans talking back and forth and trying to figure out what to do and people talking about the vault, which is where all the classified information is kept. And finally, we only heard Farsi speakers. So we knew that everyone had been captured or taken. And so then we called Kate. And they came over, and uh, that was evening by that that's time. That's right, that's right. So they came to the Andre. We were still doing all right after, as the, uh, as I said, my staff had gone out, and they came back, and we were, um, uh, and they said, yeah, it's really serious. So I called the embassy and got an answer switchboard, or from the switchboard, embassy occupied. But I remembered I had a direct extension, so I called Bruce Langan's office. And um, Anne Swift answered the phone, and she said, OK, it's bad. Um, but she said, get a hold of the guys in the communications center um, and find out what's going on from them, because they, they're still in, in touch with state. And so um, uh, I called again using this extension, called uh, them. And um, they were shredding material and, and taking care of classified stuff. And they said, call state. So they gave me the number at the Department of State to call at the operations center so that they had another, uh, another link. And so um, I and my staff, and my staff, some of my staff were helping me do this. I, you know, God bless them. They, um, they were taking a chance. But they were monitoring what was being said on radio and television, taking notes, transcribing it. And we were feeding that back to Washington, to the Ops Center, but also linking to the Communications Center until they said, oh, we're going to have to go out. And State says, well, tell them they've done a good job, and we'll say goodbye. And, she, and then the next thing I heard was, tell them they're gone. And so we told them that, and that was when the, um, the vault was uh, breached, and they were taken over um, uh, by, the, uh, by the Farsi people. So we were still at the Anjuman and still trying to figure out what was going on and reporting back. And toward evening, um, well, Kathy, um, um, uh, another uh, person had showed up there because she couldn't get back to the office. She had been at the airport that morning and was supposed to be going home. Lillian Johnson. Lillian, yeah, right. And, um, she came uh, back, and so she was there uh, helping us, and then uh, the six of you showed up, and so I said, good, we can sleep. And so we stretched out on the sofas in the uh, library, and they got on the phones with Washington until it was almost sunrise, and then I think you went to my house. We, oh. went to, we went to the other houses. You, you went to other houses. Oh, That's okay. Right. Oh, all right. So um, uh, We did eventually go to your house. Okay. They, uh, <laughs> uh, they had the car, but we were there. And then that next day, um, someone came, and I got out the back door and went around the corner to the German um, Goethe Institute, and they said, well, why don't you go home with us? And I said, oh, this has got to, this has got to get settled. This has got to simmer down, and I've got to get back to the phones. And I talked with Washington, and they said, well, do you think it's safe to get back to the phones? And I said, well, you know, I, I hope so. And, but at any rate, I went back to the Anjuman. Bill Royer, my deputy, who was the English teaching um, uh, specialist was with me, and he was working you know, right beside us. So um, the second time they came for us, Bill and I did not get away, and we were taken to the embassy compound and kept along with the rest of, the, uh, of them. So. so what happened to us, thanks to being able to talk on the phone with Kate, is that this was the most peculiar situation because the official Iranian diplomats were not in on the takeover. They were appalled. They knew this is not how you run an international affairs office. <laughs> so anyway, they, so from Kate's office, uh, my husband was talking to um, our charge and our number two who were in the ballroom at the Foreign Affairs office. And they, were, they had gone over to complain about the graffiti on the wall, and then they got stuck there. So they were trying to sort this out and find, have someone from the Iranian government go over to the embassy and tell everybody to go home. And so uh, Joe was able to talk to them. He c even called the embassy and talked to one of the hostage takers. And um, talking, to, we, he spoke to, we all spoke to Washington. And so what that meant was that 
Um, we had a number that we could call Vic later on. We could call him at the foreign ministry. So it was um, after we after we after you woke up and you loaned us your car, we went to the Lijic's house, we went to our house, I called my mother, <laughs> I said, it's all gonna be okay, don't worry. I didn't talk to her for three months. <laughs> and, um, and then Vic called and said, I have friends at the British Embassy, they'll come and get you and, and you can go spend the night at their compound. So we did, but that night, their compound was attacked too, mm -hmm. so they said, we really can't protect you, you'll need to leave. So Vic, we called Vic again, he called his Thai cook, and they could speak Thai and nobody would know what they were talking about, and his Thai cook had keys to four different embassy employees' he, homes. My cook, too. <laughs> <laughs> he was really good. <laughs> if you ever get to Boston. <laughs> That's right. His name is Sam, <laughs> and, and a last name about this lug. So, um, so, the Brits gave us a ride over to John Graves' house, who was a hostage, but Sam had the keys to the house. So Sam was waiting for us. We stayed two nights there. Um, his regular housekeeper was worried that we were eating the food and drinking the wine, and she was going to get in trouble, so she was going to turn us in. So we thought about tying her up, but we thought, no. <laughs> <laughs> and since Sam had keys to Kate's house, we went to Kate's house. And we snuck away in the night. We always had our clothes in the washing machine. So without our clothes, we go to your house. But there were no, there was no wall around it. There was just you on the street. Mm -hmm. And so then we were feeling really exposed. We knew they were going to eventually find the housing list where all the Americans lived, and we were running out of money. And so that's when Bob Anders, who'd been there about four months, uh, called his good friend John Sheardown, who was the Consul General at the Canadian Embassy, and he said, we're really in trouble now. And John said, why didn't you call sooner? <laughs> yes, we'll take you all in. And so the Brits took us, this was after about five days, the Brits took us over to the Sheardown's house, and we were in the safety, safety net of the Canadians. And tell us more about that. The Canadian government played an instrumental role in your exfiltration and keeping you safe there, especially Ambassador Ken Taylor. We're also fortunate to have Consul General Cruikshank from Chicago in attendance tonight. Um, what exactly did the Canadian government do during this time? They were absolutely amazing. Um, they didn't, we didn't know, the rest of us knew none of them, none of the Canadians. And um, they took us in. We, when we arrived at the Sheardowns, Ken Taylor was there. And he said he would take, at this point, there were five of us. There was the, the two couples and Bob Anders. And so Ken Taylor, the, the ambassador, came over to John Sheardown's house and said, I'll take two so you don't have such a big load, um, you know, to, a burden. And so Joe and I, my husband and I, do not play bridge. So we went with him so the others could <laughs> play bridge. <laughs> and so we spent the next three months on their couch. You know, we had wonderful rooms with them, but we could not leave the house. We could not call anyone. Um, we could just sit there and read the paper and get have our hopes built up and drawn down by the news. But every night, uh, Ambassador Taylor and his wife, Pat, who was working at the Pasteur Institute as a research scientist, would come home and give us any news they had and encourage us and be so kind. And so I, we... I think at Thanksgiving we had a visit with the others. We went over to the Sheardown's house and saw the other hostages. And then we were sort of hopeful at that point because we were at a good point in negotiations, but they fell through. And then at Christmas we were still there and we went over to the Sheardown's house again to see our friends. And then it was pretty bleak because we didn't see everyone. Every time they tried to negotiate with someone in the Iranian government, they'd disappear. They'd lose their position and we'd have to start all over again. So um, finally, I think the story is that Flora MacDonald, their Secretary of State for Canada, buttonholed Cyrus Vance at a meeting in Europe and said, you've got to get those people. <laughs> i got to get my people safe, and you've got to get those people out of my house, and we're going to put them on bikes <laughs> if you don't do something. So this was, um, this was December. So, so uh, Tony Mendez, the CIA officer who is absolutely brilliant, forger and exfiltrator, was given the assignment of getting us out. He thought up the idea of this Hollywood movie crew 
had the right number of people, and he had friends in Hollywood. So they set up the real Studio 8. They really opened a, a studio in Hollywood, and they, collect, you know, they sent out notices. They put notices in Variety magazine. And he came, and in three days, he, said, he gave us some choices and made it quite obvious that this is the choice we should choose. And we learned our lines, and the Canadians gave us all their clothes, because so, we didn't have any, so we had to have a suitcase. And then we went to the airport, and that was that. Ms. Cobe, can you tell us about your time as a hostage? I'll also po thank you. <laughs> thank you. <Tanda. laughs> I'll also point out you were one of only two female hostages who was held for the full 444 days. Can you tell us about that particular part of the experience? It's always very difficult to t um, to try and capsulize that because it's covered such a long period of time. I realized sort of, let me back up. People say, how did you do it? I say two things. Iowa pragmatism, I'm a farmer's daughter. <laughs> you got to make it work. And the other one is I'm a cradle Lutheran. I was taken to church when I was um, born to be baptized, and I grew up in a family of faith. And so my perspective on all of this happening, and actually, I just met a couple of the Marines at Bruce Langan's um, a funeral a couple of weeks ago, and one of the Marines said to me, he said, Kate, why did you not ever say you were in solitary? He said, you keep saying I was alone. My mind didn't work in those connections of this is solitary um, imprisonment. My mind worked to the point, my God, I've been given an incredible gift of time. No appointments, no meetings, no plans. Um, what can I do with it? And I've always been fascinated ever since I visited Austria the first time about the contemplative orders of the Roman Catholic Church. My mother said she didn't think I was ever going to talk. And I started in at 18 months, and she said she didn't think she would ever shut me up. <laughs> I love words. I love communication. And here I was in a situation where I was being told constantly, don't to speak, don't to speak. And so using what I had, a knowledge that I had from the past, I thought, OK, I can explore this contemplative time. And so that's where I started from. It was frightening because you didn't know what was going on. It was frightening because you didn't know what was happening to your colleagues. It was miserable because you didn't know what was happening to your family. And you worried about your family worrying about you. But for me, it was moving through a series of rooms all by myself um, from November 22nd, which is when Anne left, was taken out of the room that we had been sharing. She at one end and I at the other, and don't to speak. Um, and I know it was the 22nd because it was my sister's birthday, my youngest sister's birthday. That's why that date is there. And it was March before she convinced them that she needed to have a roommate, and we were allowed to become roommates again. So during that time, it was one sort of a thing. Um, you didn't know what was going on, whether you were going to be questioned, uh, whether you were going to be challenged, whether you were going to be left completely alone. Um, and part of the time, I was in a, a little room that was a library, an embassy library. So I at least had things to read. Um, I love to read almost as much as I love to talk. So I read the 1976 football year book, Scuba Diving in Caves, <laughs> The History of Bell Telephone. And actually, there was an administrative, an, an MBA textbook in one of the rooms that I got started on. Fortunately, well, they found some other material for me. So it was a strange combination of what next and is anything going on or are we just sitting here? So I, I, I don't know how to describe it any differently than, you know, if you don't like what's going on, wait 15 minutes, it'll probably change. The one thing that was one could not change, one could not blot, were the demonstrations at night. The chance of death to America, death to Carter, and the noise outside the embassy compound. And um, that went on. Uh, on a, a regular basis 
um, from from the first from the first day until until we left almost. Well, actually, they had moved us into Avine Prison and then into another place. But as long as we were on the compound, we could almost always count on demonstrations at least on Friday and Saturday nights. Ms. Stafford, what happened when you got to the airport, and how did it feel to return home to the United States? Uh, when we got to the airport, they were very clever about when we would leave. We left first thing in the morning. It was about seven o'clock, a 7 o'clock flight or so, so we were there at 5 o'clock. So that meant the Revolutionary Guards, who were the big bullies, were not there yet. And so it was sort of quiet, and we were worried about these some of these little slips that we were supposed to have uh, that would have been in their files someplace. And we were worried about that, but we, that we, we weren't stopped. We got through immigration, we thought we were home free, and then it turned out our flight was delayed. So then we thought, why was our flight delayed? And uh, we talked to Tony, and he said it would look even more suspicious if we tried to get on another flight. So they said, just sit tight. So we, um, the, the, the flight came in in about an hour, we got on the flight, and we did not have the runways seen, I'm sorry, I'm happy to say. <laughs> Thank goodness. So, so when we finally um, were on the plane, we felt good, but we knew we, it wasn't over yet. We had to wait till they said, You're, we are now out of Iranian airspace. And I, when I saw that in the movie, I felt the same relief. <laughs> I thought, they got away. <laughs> they did. <clears throat> but, it was, uh, but that was really a wonderful moment. And um, afterwards, when, the other, when you were still hostages, I would have dreams that I was on that plane, and, the, and you were all on the plane, but you wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> and so then when the hostages were freed, they brought us back. And when you all were able to tell us that you were happy that we got out, that it was like a point for our side, it was. then I didn't have these dreams anymore. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Uh, one of the, um, the young women who was one of our guards had left something on her desk. And I was sort of curious. You know, she was gone out of the room, so how close can I get? And there was something about eight Americans having gotten um, a home. And um, well, part of that, that wasn't, they also sent um, a thir 13, wasn't That's it? That's right, uh, 13. Eight women That's and right. five men, five African Americans home. And that was very interesting. Why did they send African Americans home? Because African Americans, it's well known, are highly oppressed by the USG. And by showing this goodwill, of releasing these, except for the one that they kept because they thought he could put the computer back together. Um, you know, okay, we have our fun. Um, that the black American community, the African American community would rise up in solidarity with them against our government. That's what one of the young women explained to me. She had never met an African American or an African because one day she came into the office, or in, into the office, right, well, we were in offices, we were held in offices in the embassy. She came into the room and she said, I like black people. And I said, oh? And she said, yeah, they're really nice. And I said, um, and she said, I just met some. They're, they're, we have some here from Africa and they're really, really nice. And I said, well, yeah, I like some black um, Americans and some, um, then they're really nice, and there are some that aren't so nice. They're just like people, and, and you know, good and bad. So, uh, and uh, but she had never had that experience, and so the a lot of what they were thinking and working was very much outside of the realm of their personal experience, and and so that made for some very interesting conversations sometimes when you were trying to figure out what was going on. It, 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 um, but that's what diplomacy is all about, discovery. And, and that's when it gets exciting, when you can discover something. And Ms. Kobe, Sorry. <laughs> how did you find out you were coming home, and what did it feel like to come back to the US? Um, Anne and I were um, in our room at the guest house, and something was afoot. We didn't know what. Um, but there were a group of Algerian doctors, medical doctors there, and they were giving us exams, which was sort of weird, um, and uh, oh, oh, so many stories. And, um, and then they said, well, get your stuff together, you're going home. 
They told us before, we moved 13 times during the course of the 14 months. Um, I did. And uh, they'd always say, get your stuff, out. We, we, you're moving. And so, um, but they'd never said going home. And so Anne and I were really very skeptical. Um, and then we had our getaway bags together, and we said, we're ready, let's go. And um, they said, well, we'll be back for you a little bit later. And then when they took us out of the building and put us on a bus, for the first time we were put on a bus with the men. We had always been moved separately. And so they, um, uh, we got to the airport, and I thought we might really be going home when we got to the airport, and there were two Algerian planes on the ground, and um, we were uh, loaded into one. And before we could even ask the questions, is and yes, everybody is here, and yes, nobody is seriously harmed um, physically. As we found out later, a lot of people carried very deep emotional um, uh, scars with them. And so we were on the plane, and actually I, I said, did anybody lose a, um, a watch? And it was a Seiko. Did anybody lose a Seiko? Because we'd found it. They had brought us something so that we would know what time it was, so we could, for whatever reason. And it actually um, belonged to, a, to one of the uh, military attaches that they had, <laughs> um, they had taken it. <laughs> Before I open up to questions from the audience, one final question. How did your experiences in Iran shape your perceptions of the country and its people? Iran is what I thought it was before I got there. It is a country of very proud people who have a right to be proud of their long history, their poetry, their literature, their music, their art, and so many things they instigated. Even they were the ones who were responsible uh, responsible uh, for diplomatic immunity um, when the Silk Road was established. Uh, how many thousand years ago? This is a country that is complex and that has a lot of different um, pulls in many many different ways. And they have a very uh, they have a big job just to be able to recognize each other and to move with each other. And I would like to find, and they all want the same things we want. They want education for their kids. They want a nice house. They want a good job and plenty of food and people taken care of uh, when they're ill. We all want that. Now, let's figure out how to get it done, people. Ms. Kent, Kent, that's beautiful. <laughs> right, thank you. We have some time now for questions from the audience. As a reminder to our live stream audience, you can submit your questions by typing ccga.live into your browser. For our in-room audience, please raise your hand if you have a question. I'll acknowledge you, and please make sure your question is a question. Yes, sir, in the third row, please. And a microphone is on its way. How did your life change when the aborted rescue mission failed in the desert? What did they do to you? Did you fear for your life? We didn't know it had happened. Uh, we knew something unusual had gone on because there was an unusual amount of gunfire around the embassy. Um, and we didn't know whether it was more Iraqis or, or what because that was always in the, in the brush. Um, and we were moved and at some point a couple of days later, one of the men came to me and he said, Hanuman Kob, you cook, don't you? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, we need you to cook for you and Miss Swift and for some of the men. And I said, well, how many am I cooking? Oh, I can't tell you. And I said, no, wait a minute. You know, I have to have an, and he said, well, let's just say it'll be for four or five people. That was our first indication that some of our um, colleagues had been moved off of the compound or at least were not there with us. But we didn't know that. We just knew that all of a sudden there was a need for me to cook for the two of us and for two or three other people. Um, and then later, uh, we, I got a letter that I'm pretty sure I wasn't supposed to get because they did give us some of the letters that were mailed to us by school children and other people that we didn't know. Because, of course, anybody that we knew was going, although I did get some letters from my sisters, but they, um, um, and, um, and this little girl said, I, sorry, the rescue attempt failed. I hope they try again. And Anne and I sort of looked at each other and thought, how is this figuring? And then they gave us a 
back issue of Newsweek, I think it was. But the stories about Iran and the United States were torn out. You could see where they'd torn out stories. They forgot the table of contents and the letters to the editor. <laughs> it was a feast. <laughs> so there was, but that's also how we learned eight men died trying to rescue us. That was not a feast. That was stunning, absolutely stunning. And Anne and I never did come up with another word that could describe how we felt when we learned that. Just stunned. Yes, in the second to last row, please. I guess in the uh, events leading up to the takeover politically, when, when the Shah left, did you feel that foreign policy let you down and not backing the Shah, or was the um, revolution unstoppable? We knew the revolution was... Um, was there to stay. It wasn't going to go away. But the Shah, um, the Shah's leaving to go into the United States was, I think, as um, Kathy's already pointed out, a real danger point. And I think we all agreed with our, um, uh, our charge that this was not, not advisable. And I understand from subsequent conversations with um, the vice president, with Vice President Mondale and other people, that there were hours spent in discussion as to whether this was good policy or not, and Cy Vance, as a matter of fact, resigned um, because he so strongly disagreed with it. It was not an easy decision for President Carter to make, but I think he did what he thought, given the person that President Carter is of such integrity and humanity that he really saw this as a, hum uh, 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 a humanity issue. Thank you. One additional note for our live stream audience. There is actually a revised link, and you can type in your questions at meet.ps slash Iran. Thank you. Yes, sir, in the second row. Uh, first off, just thank you so much for your incredible service and courage on behalf of our country. Um, I understand that both of you, after returning home, ended up going back out, getting back into the Foreign Service, going, serving again in new places, some pretty difficult places even. Can you talk a little bit about what that decision process was like? Was that a difficult choice to make? And kind of why was it important to continue in your line of work? Why don't you go ahead first. Well, <clears throat> in our case, we thought we'd check the box and it couldn't possibly happen again. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I was evacuated from the Ivory Coast, and then I was evacuated from Sudan. <laughs> now I live in Niger. <laughs> I'm pushing my luck. Um, it's a fascinating fascinating life. My husband loves what he does, and he does it well. And uh, I'm a painter, so every place I go, I have new things to paint and new subject matter. And um, we think it's important work. So um, we keep going out. Well, I chose my next job very carefully. I left Washington. <laughs> I actually went to New York City. Um, that was one of my assignments. We have something called a foreign press center in, the New York, in New York City, and we work with resident and visiting foreign correspondents. Our busiest season is, of course, during the um, UN General Assembly. But that was an opportunity to sort of feel out uh, what was going to happen um, and whether this was something I wanted to continue with what other options were out there, if there were. And I found that actually I really liked what I was doing, um, and I liked the possibilities of what I could do uh, in addition, in, more in educational and, and, and cultural exchange work, which I think is so vital uh, to uh, all of our interests worldwide. Yes, sir. On the side, please. And a microphone's on its way. Thank you so much. I just want to say thank you for sharing. Uh, you just presented to us as if it happened yesterday. 
It was really great memory. My question to both of you, have you had the chance to go back and visit the places that you have been in Iran? Thank you. I think my family would tie me up and lock me in a room <laughs> if they even thought I was getting close to the place. No, um, I would not want to put anybody there in an awkward position, number one. Number two, I have amazing Iranian friends right here in the United States. And um, I'm able to um, enjoy knowing them and um, not worrying about their safety and or my safety, and we can still uh, have our conversations and carry on. Would I like to go back? Yein. <laughs> <laughs> I lived in, Ger in German-speaking countries for eight years, and that's yes and no <laughs> all at once. <laughs> I'd be afraid to go back. I'm, unfortunately, Iran keeps taking innocent citizens and using them as hostages to exchange. And right. I think there's a number of people right now who are in that position and, and have just been nabbed and are, will be used either for political make points. So I, I would love to go back. It was the absolutely most beautiful country, and there's so much of it I haven't seen but I'm not going to take that chance. Yes, sir, in the back, please. Uh, midway back. I'm sorry about your trauma there. I've got a question. Given that thousands of Americans have been killed by Japanese, Germans, Koreans, and who have you, we've still managed to have very good relations with them after so many years. We've got a great economy with the Japanese, with the Germans, and everybody, but somehow we've got a psychological block with Iran. We can't seem to get over it. Can you explain that? I think they can't get, it, get over it either. They've been scarred or haunted by our, our interference in their election with Mossadegh, and so they believe that we are not trustworthy and for recent, recent uh, events, they feel that we don't keep our word. And we will always have Iran. That was really the beginning of our first confrontation with um, militant Islam. And so we have this shadow over everything. I think any kind of thinking we do about having relations with Iran, it's always in the back of our minds, can we trust them? They don't follow international law. So, um. And even though we knew the Shah was terminally ill with cancer um, and that his coming to the United States was um, a last-ditch uh, chance for him, the Iranians, remembering Mossadegh, were absolutely convinced it was a ploy to put him back in power. And uh, we, there's just, I think you said it right, Kathy. There's a, there's a long history there that we have to work at bit by bit, piece by piece. We only have a few minutes remaining, so I'd, li I'd like to ask you for these last few minutes if you could tell us a little bit about where your lives have taken you since you left Iran. Um, let's see. I decided after those days that life is short and fragile and I should be painting because that's my passion. <laughs> so that's what I have been doing for the last 35 years. I have exhibitions and workshops with local painters and um, I work now with the School for the Deaf. We'll do little art classes in Niger because they have very little access to anything at all and that's something that we can all focus on together. And I can't say much of anything in sign language, but I'm learning. <laughs> and on that note, we'll have a slideshow of some of Ms. Stafford's artwork on the screens as you exit the conference center this evening. Good, great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I stayed in the Foreign Service and ended up New York, and then I went to Vienna for four years, Munich for four years, back to Washington, off to Australia, which was one of my aims when I went in 27 years earlier, and retired from the Foreign Service to end up doing adjunct work at my alma mater, Wartburg College in Waverly, Iowa, where, surprise, surprise, I ended up teaching theater the first uh, time I was there. Well, I have a master's in theater. That was my undergraduate. How with theater do you get into the Foreign Service? You do cultural exchange. And then I ended up teaching intercultural communication as well as and this is really important, reconciliation. And that's why I feel so strongly that we have to seek to find those 
points where we can find agreement and where we can build on um, for each other a new and a, and, a, and a better world. Hate doesn't produce anything of really fine quality. It destroys us and it tears us apart. And when we give into it, it destroys us each and every day. Um, back to my, my uh, Lutheran roots, we're said, you know, love your enemies. Not easy, but God's grace is sufficient for most um, of that. And so I feel so strongly that we need to be able to help people reconcile what has happened in their lives to move forward and not let that keep them bogged down forever. That's, the, that's where it's taken me. Oops. It's wonderful to end on that optimistic note, Ms. Cope, Ms. Stafford. Thank you for sharing those very powerful experiences with us. Thank you for your service, and please join me in thanking our speakers tonight. <laughs> Thank you.